Uh, one of the costs you probably want to incur up front than on the back end, right? It's very crucial. Uh, and so again, uh, it's all about getting ahead of the curve. I think that's one of the big takeaways that we can have throughout our days here. And that one of the things that NADDA provides, especially with our experience and our time here, is really putting you in a position where you can get ahead of the curve, where you can get some of the information, knowledge uh, that maybe you've had questions about or really want to know, and really be able to take that back home and start putting some of those practices into application. Uh, a couple highlights and keys that I want to continue to mention. If you have not downloaded the mobile app already, make sure you do that. I know I've also received some questions about uh, if some of the sessions that we've had here, if they'll be available at a later date. And to that, uh, some of them are being recorded, so they may be available later on uh, on the NADA website. But again, you can also check the mobile app where we'll be able to uh, tell you if some of those things are going to be available. A little bit later in the afternoon, we are going to be streaming one of the general sessions so you guys can feel free to hang out in this area as we will be streaming that on the monitors uh, and so you can take part of that right here. You don't have to leave or uh, do anything like that. So uh, we're going to continue and moving our afternoon forward. Uh, and again, I also encourage if you have questions or things that maybe you really want to drill down on that you've heard throughout these sessions, make sure you visit us in the NADA Pavilion. It's there inside the West Hall. As soon as you go in through the entrance, you just make an immediate left. You'll see it on the right hand side. You can't miss it. It has an orange uh, banner, circular banner up at top. And then also, if you have electrification questions, don't forget about our EV Solution Center, which is over in the North Hall. And as you make your way through the North Hall, don't forget we have that EV history timeline where you can really walk through and see some of the history of where EV has come from and obviously where it's heading towards in the future. All right. So with that being said, we are going to go ahead and continue to move forward with our afternoon sessions uh, as we get forward. And next up, uh, what we are actually going to talk about is exactly that, EVs. Because as you guys have seen with the buttons and the, uh, some of the information you have in your packets, dealers are all in for EVs. And so we want to spend some time talking about that. And are EV buyers all in for dealers? So we're going to look at it from two sides. We know that dealers may be all in, but are our buyers all in uh, right now? And so to help us in doing that, uh, I'd like to welcome here uh, Jared Allen. We also are going to be joint. You guys forgot the house rule. When I say the names, you guys can start applauding, right? This is not a graduation, right? Crowd part there you see, thank, thank you, thank you. You guys are great. No, I'm just teasing you guys. I'm always going to give you a hard time. I told you, we're going to have fun, right? You're not just going to sit there and, and look and stare. We're going to have fun to interact. So thank you guys for always having fun with me. Uh, but again, Jared Allen, I'd like to welcome him to the stage. He's here. And Jared, do you want to introduce our other? Yes, I'm happy to. Perfect. All right, come on up, Jared. Thank you. Thank you. We like to have multiple MCs going on all day so nobody gets too bored or, or et cetera. So um, again, I'm Jared Allen with NADA. And um, as, as Errol said, um, you know, obviously a big focus of the NADA show has been EVs, uh, a lot on EV education, a lot of, uh, on EV training. We certainly know the, the manufacturers are on as well. And there's been one piece of this puzzle that um, hasn't been talked about, not just here, but in general, for, for a while now, and that's what do the consumers say? What do the consumers want about not just the product, um, but about the sales experience um, and about the service experience? What are future EV customers, um, what do they desire out of a, uh, when they're learning about EVs and going through the process of purchasing what for many of them is gonna be their, their first? Um, well, I'll tell you the answer might surprise you because it's cutting against what we hear um, constantly about what is conventional wisdom, uh, which is essentially that, well, they, they want a sort of a direct uh, route to sales. That's not necessarily true. And we're gonna get started here in, in just a minute. Um, and I'll introduce our, we have two panelists. We have uh, Mike DeVorne, um, who is with the uh, human behavior and analytics firm Escalant. And Mike Dvorne is the head of Escalant's EV Forward project, um, which is the largest ever survey to date of future EV customers in the US uh, and what they want to see out of the, uh, the retail uh, process. Um, and Jamie Butters, who is the executive editor of Automotive News, is going to talk to Mike about uh, his, his EV Forward study. And uh, joining Mike Dvorne on stage is going to be Mike Stanton, the CEO, uh, President and CEO of NADA, 
Um, so in just a second, when we can finally get everybody mic'd up and sit down, um, we'll get the conversation going and uh, we'll have a, a good discussion. Again, Jamie Butters, um, who many of you probably know as, as the editor of Automotive News, is gonna guide the discussion here. So we'll be right back, thank you. All right, good crowd, good crowd. I would hope we'd have a good crowd for this, talking about EVs and uh, the future of how they're sold. It seems to be what the, the show's all about, what uh, at least half the people are here for. I'm Jamie Butters, executive editor of Automotive News. How y'all doing? I'm here with Mike Devorney from uh, the vice president of automotive for Escalant, and a guy many of you probably have heard of, Mike Stanton, president of NADA. Chair, uh, president, that's the right title, right? Yeah. CEO, president? Yeah, both work. Okay, good. <laughs> so we're gonna talk about EVs. Of course, uh, dealers are all in, I've heard that. Dealers are all in on EVs. You heard that a few times? <laughs> I've heard it a few times. Good. And uh, it might be up on the board behind us. Good. Um, Mike, for those of you who don't know, Mike, Mike Devorney uh, with Escalant has done an incredible, exhaustive study on not the so much the cutting edge uh, two percent or so that have bought EVs in this uh, country, but the the mass of new car buyers who may someday, who probably someday will buy an EV. You can tell us about that. How does it work? How how ten thousand people more than that? Uh, well, so now we've actually spoken to over thirty thousand uh, new car buyers <laughs> and. Uh, it, you really, you hit on the point. Essentially, what we wanted to understand was not necessarily what we can learn from early adopters of EVs, but what do people need who haven't purchased one yet or who may not for you know, the next couple of years? Because uh, in many cases, we've found that what they need or what they want is pretty different from EV early adopters. Those people who bought $100,000 Model S's are not the same as those who buy <laughs> Civics and F-150s? Turns out they're not exactly <laughs> the same. Change, exactly. Change. What is different? I mean. Let me I'll just uh, plunge forward and say I, I presume that those people buying the hundred thousand dollar Teslas and even the the early Leaf buyers, right? They're either they're technophiles, they're they're super high income, or they're just people who have to have the latest thing, you know, whatever that is, or they're super environmental minded and are willing to pay a premium for that. Uh, and how does that differ what, from? the other folks, the other new car buyers? You know, one of the biggest differences we found with the really early adopters and then some of the, the, you know, the consumers we're looking at that will end up purchasing in the next few years is the earlier adopters have been more willing to actually make compromises. Mm -hmm. So the vehicle that they want maybe doesn't exactly exist, but they'll, you know, okay, I'll make this work or I'll sort of adjust my life around it. The other difference we found is that the early adopters were really much more kind of actualized in terms of researching, doing their own work, whereas these later buyers, um, they absolutely need to, you know, they're relying more on dealers, on websites, on other people to help them get informed when it's time for them to purchase. But they're not really researching in advance. Hmm. So yeah, they're, they're a harder group to find because of that. <laughs> uh, Mike, for the, the incumbent brands, the traditional brands that have sold EVs, what's their process been like and, and how have they navigated that different type of customer from those early days to maybe a future state. Jay, are you referring to the legacy automakers? Yes, yes. Yeah, so the, the, the dealers that I represent. Your guys, yeah. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, I mean, as, as we said, dealers are all, all in on EVs and we're absolutely essential when it comes to delivering these products to the market. We're a little short on product right now. We're excited. When the product gets here, we want to make sure that we're ready. And so uh, we launched a new initiative, we mentioned it earlier this morning, that we have partnered with the Center for Sustained Energy and Plug in America, uh, and with the Alliance's support, we are gonna start to roll out education, uh, not product specific, that's for our manufacturers, but education for, for dealers to be ready to, uh, to sell to these mass, mass market uh, you know, consumers. Educating dealers, how to educate their staff, how to educate their customers. Yes. That's the cascade. Exactly, okay. and the good news from Mike's great work, and we, we love the, uh, uh, the conclusion is that you know, these customers, the ones that are ready for the mass market, they enjoy their experience at the dealership, and that's what they're expecting. Because buying a car, as you all know, is not a, you know, it's not like buying a tube of toothpaste on Amazon. 
You need to qualify for the car. Many customers have a trade. They need to find out what that's worth, what that difference looks like. They need financing. And they have a whole host of new questions when it comes to, you know, how do I plug this thing into my house? How can I get from point A to point Z if it's further than a, you know, a single charge point? And consumers told us via the uh, Escalon survey that they want to talk to people. You know, I don't want to throw numbers out there, Mike, because you'll end up correcting me. But the vast majority want to talk to somebody and, and get these questions answered in person. And we as dealers feel like we just need to be there where these consumers want to be met. Sure, we need to be there online for them to research. They want to buy online. Our dealers can do that. But what we're finding is that they really want a hybrid type of experience. And we just want to make sure as an ADA we're ready to, to deliver on what it is that they're asking for. You know, uh before we get into Tesla, <laughs> I mean, I do think, you know, what you're saying, it makes so much sense in that it's, it's new, it's, it's different, and the experience is such an important factor in the appeal of EVs. Um, aside from, you know, whether new is exciting for its own sake um, or how you, your concerns about the environment, when you have that instant torque and the, the silence, it's a different experience, probably one you'd want to ex experience before you plunk down tens of thousands of dollars. Sure. Yeah, absolutely. So, I mean, so test drive is, yeah, is test key. test drive is key, right? It's key, absolutely, yeah. So, uh, Mike D., you were, um, mentioned the compromises that the early adopters were willing to, to, to make. Elaborate on that a little more. What, what are the things that real buyers, that the mass market is not willing to tolerate that the early buyers would? Yeah, it's a great question. You know, we found, for instance, when you look at the segments that these next EV buyers want vehicles to be in, broadly those haven't been the segments that EVs have been in so far. So, you know, ultimately, hey, I'm, I'm used to having a midsize SUV. I'm looking at something that, you know, is dramatically smaller or uh, doesn't have the same functionality. Those are really tough things for people to get their head around. I mean, a lot of the early adopters, if this was a, an occasional use vehicle or a third vehicle, it was easier to work around that. But with these mainstream consumers, this is going to be the vehicle that they use for the most part. It really needs to be something that they can have all the functionality that they need. They need the range. They need the space. And, and the cost, right? I mean, we've right. heard a lot about that lately. Uh, on the manufacturer side, uh, Carlos Tavares at Stellantis has said, you know, it costs 50% more to make an electric vehicle. I mean, that's just a problem that's going to have to get solved. Uh, for consumers to want to 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 pay up for it, or you know, not to not to have to pay up for it, <laughs> to get the right. same quality of vehicle, the same utility, uh, for the same value, for the same price. Exactly, that's exactly what we found. Yeah, Jamie, do you think about it? We talk about the cost, the expense. Uh, the manufacturers are investing billions and billions of dollars. Dealers have invested at least two, probably closer to three, when it's all said and done, to get ready you know, to buy the battery storage and to upgrade the lifts and the forklifts and all the things that are going to be required to sell and service these vehicles. And then we've got the government also placing a big, big bet when it comes to incentives. So everybody is kind of ramping up and getting prepared for this. And it's just important that we're working together to make sure it all works because there's a lot of money at stake. Yeah. Because the other thing, we were talking about education earlier. Sorry, this slipped my mind. But, you know, we all grew up you know, hearing about how to take care of a car, how to drive a car, how to treat it, you know, how to, how to handle it. And some of the elements are different. And there's just, you know, if you're 50 years behind your learning curve on EVs, you've got some catching up to do. Yeah, well, I mean, I used to change the oil. <laughs> right. Uh, my parents' cars, that's, that's what we did. Yeah. Not too many people are changing the oil at, at home uh, today. There used to be tune-ups way back when. You know, we're not, we're not doing those either. So the dealers will find a way to, uh, you know, to be relevant in the, in the service department. And I think the consumers are going to be looking for that expertise on how to not just take care of their vehicle, but fix the vehicle. And again, we're just in the process of ramping up and getting everyone ready to do just that. Mike Devorney, do you, in your survey, do you talk to people about total cost of ownership? You know, there's, of course, the upfront cost is higher for an EV. Maybe you pay to have a charger in your home, but then you're saving money on fuel, you're saving time. Uh, of course, that fuel factor seems like a bigger deal now uh, sure. with prices uh, up, at least for the, for the moment. Is that part of your study? It, it is part of what we do, um, and it, it really is important. You know, in a lot of ways, you talk about some of the early adopters who, you know, are really willing to spend a lot more to make an impact on the environment. 
And when we look to some of these, these later buyers, you know, in many cases, they still care about the environment, mm -hmm. but they need the, the green in the sense of the money needs to make sense as well. <laughs> so the, the, the total cost of ownership part really is a, is a key part for them. Mm -hmm. So I want to talk, I'm glad you're here, Mike Stanton, to talk about the dealer side because some of the things about how retail works, some of it has to do with the customer's mindset and some has to do with what's realistic for dealers. So uh, just recently, Ford announced their plans to you know, split their company internally between the EV business, Model E, and the gas burning business, Ford Blue. And there's some very vague but uh, important suggestions about uh, how retailing electric vehicles you know, w should change, will change, likely will change under this system. Um, like no inventory, tra transparent but no haggle pricing, uh, more tailored facilities requirements. Um, first with Mike Devorney, what do you... What does your research tell you about how consumers would feel about that approach? Maybe uh, they can test drive a vehicle, they'll have more hands-on you know, education available, but they're still going to have to order it, it's going to get delivered. What's, what's the thinking like that from a consumer standpoint? You know, one of the things that we explored was, it's, when it comes to electric vehicles, it's easy to put Tesla on a pedestal. I mean, they, they sell more EVs than the rest of the manufacturers combined, or they have so far. But in many cases in the work that we do, we try to challenge this idea that, well, they've been successful in EVs, therefore we should do what they're doing. And one of those when it came to retail is we asked consumers, basically, tell us about, you know, what is your ideal? Um, and what we did is we actually took the elements of the Tesla approach and we sort of debadged them. We didn't make it Tesla and we had consumers respond to it. So we could understand what parts of what Tesla does or what, you know, perhaps Ford is going to try to follow consumers respond to, um, and what parts maybe not so much. And you know, ultimately what we found is when we had everybody take a look at it and say, okay, you know, essentially, would you take an approach that is more Tesla-like or more what you've been used to? Mm -hmm. Overwhelmingly, these next, well, it was not just these next EV buyers, it was basically all consumers except for Tesla owners said, <laughs> look, we like going to the dealership. We like having a human being we can interact with. Um, we like not having to do service only through our phone. Things like that that, you know, ultimately we hear as negative points when we talk to even Tesla owners that to us really had us kind of raise our hand and say, hey, I know there's a lot of discussion about moving towards this sort of more Tesla-like approach, but when we talk to the consumers, and many thousands of them, they're telling us that's not their ideal. Well, but now help me square this with what we keep hearing about omni-channel, because people do want to shop online. Some people want to do all of it online, probably not very many, but some want to do a lot, some want to do some, and then go before they go to the dealership. Is that also built into that? When, when you ask them Tesla versus traditional, do they, do a lot of them land in the middle? We, so even when we look at these, you know, the people that are almost kind of in line for the next electric vehicles, even with them, we found that they still, I mean, of course, they'll do research online in advance when they sort of get to that stage. Um, but in general, they're doing a lot less research than some of the really early adopters who were into, you know, they were passionate about it. So it became sort of a hobby or something that they would do. Um, but at the end of the day, when it came to actually purchasing the vehicle, kind of really getting serious about it, that's where we found basically nearly everyone said, I still want to go and see it. I, you know, especially it's new technology. Yep. I, I'd like to actually experience the vehicle, try it out, um, and ask questions of people. Because that's another big difference that we found is, you know, with these, these later buyers, they really have expressed to us a desire to be able to have, for instance, a salesperson at the dealership be able to help educate them about all these new aspects of the vehicle. So, yes, they're doing research online, but to, to paint it as though we don't need to have physical locations is just not something we're hearing at all. Yeah. Well, but not just research, but, you know, applying for credit, you know, getting that out of the way at home, you know, in the evening after dinner and not having to spend it while I'm sitting across a desk from somebody, you know, those kinds of things that people right. tend to say that they want. I mean, it makes sense to me that they would want that. And we, we have found, you know, there, there are, there's more openness as we monitor it over time to, to trying to do some of those things in person, uh, or sorry, to do it virtually. Okay. But even still, when we look at, you know, we just did uh, 
six months ago, we just did a latest round looking into this, it still was overwhelmingly towards doing things in a way that people are used to when it comes to making this major purchase. So in, in the vast majority of cases, they're not really getting the financing in advance. They still like the ability to talk to people in, in person. Um, we've also got some feedback too. If some of the, the aspects people try to do virtually, the reality of it tends to not quite live up to what to them is acceptable. Mm -hmm. And so that often is not part of the conversation of, well, everyone's going to start doing it this way. And we look at it and say, well, we're talking to people that are doing it that way. <laughs> They're not all having great experiences yet. So Mike, I, I realize it uh, would be a tough spot for you to be evaluating Ford's plan that doesn't exist yet. So I'm not going to ask you to do that. But when I first heard about it, and I heard that Ford wanted to set the pricing for EVs, no, well, forget it. The dealers are never gonna go for that. They, uh, the ability to ne negotiate their own prices is sacrosanct. And then I've been pretty surprised so far to hear at least some openness, like, well, let's see what the details are. You know, let's, let's really hear what, what they're bringing to the table. How do, you, how do you wrap your head around what's going on there and the reaction, the initial reaction to Ford's suggestion? Well, I mean, the details are yet to be seen. And yeah. Ford has told us those are a couple months out. What has been seen and told to us and communicated in, in Automotive News and with Jim Farley's letter is that Ford recognizes that they need its dealer network. They, in fact, think its dealer network is a strategic advantage as they move, uh, as they journey toward electrification. And, and we appreciate that. We'll take that for now and we'll wait and see what the details look like. And I think the details really, it should, it should be a shared, uh, it should be about the customer, mm -hmm. you know, and, and shortening the transaction time and delivering on a customer experience that is shaped by both car company and dealer input. Mm -hmm. If we can focus on the customer and doing what's right by them, those are the factories that are gonna win in the marketplace and who better than the dealers that are talking to your customers. Mm -hmm. So I think that's what needs to be the focus. In days gone by, the focus has been on, well, is it the OEM's customer or the dealer's customer? Well, that's kind of a silly fight, because I to tell you what, the customers told us they don't care about that. They just want a great experience, and we can, we can improve there. We have an opportunity, and I think electric vehicles has given us that opportunity. And not, not that you want to call COVID an opportunity, but that has accelerated the dealer adoption of digital retailing tools, shortening that transaction time. So things are headed in the right direction. We just need to communicate better. And, uh, you know, as I said, I always say, we just got to collaborate and st stay focused on what the customer wants, not what we want as dealers or what we want as manufacturers. Okay. Mike Devorney, I want to ask, press on another element of the traditional model versus kind of where, say, Ford and, and a lot of the way EVs are being sold right now. Do future EV buyers have a different concept of time, right? Are they, are they, I mean, they want a faster process in the store, but are they willing to wait to drive? You talk about having the traditional model versus the Tesla model. Tesla, you have to order and then they bring it to you. Traditionally, you go and you drive it off the lot. And a lot of, I mean, whether it's the Hummer now that's you know, slow rolling out or it's just any of these in-demand vehicles or as it's kind of planned for a lot of EVs going forward that you're gonna order it and maybe it'll be a day or two, maybe it'll be a week or two. Are people, do you think people are willing to accept that? You know, one of the things that to me is a caveat we are trying to keep in mind is that, you know, given the, the supply situation with vehicles now, it, it's easy for people to draw conclusions of, you know, oh, look, people are, they're waiting more to get vehicles. Well, in many cases, they have to. Um, and so we're really trying to keep it in, in the context of, you know, are we noticing a long-term shift or is this more situational? And you know, overall what I can say is, because I, I think the short answer is, I don't think we have a definitive answer on that. Um, but what we do see for the most part is that there's nothing else in people's lives that is getting anything except more towards more instant gratification. You know, it, so the idea that there's gonna be a lot more waiting in that regard is, you know, it's just something that we don't really see elements of that yet. So, uh, you know, might things change perhaps, but, um, kind of looking at the rest of the behavior that human beings are, are doing doesn't really give you a lot of uh, reason to believe that that's necessarily going to happen. Right. So maybe um, that should be a note of caution for the brands that are trying to go to a zero inventory, buy now, we'll deliver soon model. 
Well, and or it's soon, it's soon, soon enough. Is it how soon is soon? Because it's, I mean, it's, it's one of those where, of course, it's, you know, there are benefits and it sounds great in the ideal, but to the extent you're convinced that, you know, your customers are going to wait and your competitor has vehicles in stock, well, that's a, so, a sale that was probably just lost. So, you know, there's always that element of it as well. Yeah, I think it'd be a mistake to make assumptions or forecast based on where the market is right now. Very exceptional times that we're living in. Yeah. And extraordinary times. Yeah. So one of the main compromises that customer EV buyers have had to make so far is on price. Uh, how important, do you have any sense how important the federal subsidies are uh, for buyers? I mean, when we do, we've pretty, done pretty detailed research around not just how important is pricing, but how, you know, what is essentially the, the demand curve look like? If you make small, you know, changes in price, like how much does it really drive demand? And the short answer is, I mean, it is the most important factor uh, by far. So it is important for sure. But to be honest, when we look at, so, you know, when you look at the market as a whole, yes, pricing is really important and that is going to move the needle. But what we've noticed is that there are actually quite a few people we've identified in the research who essentially are convinced their next vehicle should be an EV but they're waiting for the right product or they're waiting, you know, they've got certain reasons to wait. And in many cases for them, so sort of our, our kind of easiest, lowest hanging fruit, it's not price. It's, it's having actually product that works for them that ends up being the, the single biggest thing. So I think that there tends to be probably too much focus on price. And a lot of that is, has been based on product that in the past really didn't come even remotely close to what consumers truly wanted. And we're getting much closer now, but I, I think I would just caution it's, you know, price is a factor, but it shouldn't be focused on exclusively. And I'd just like to add too, is we've, we've worked with, with the government and had a chance to provide input with regard to EV incentives. And those are important to get right. They need to work in the showroom, and by that we mean they need to work for consumers. They need to be easy to understand. They need to be available across all makes, all EV models and available for all consumers. If you want to start limiting that availability, you have no chance, no chance to get to the numbers that have been projected out there. We need to be able to uh, uh, make these incentives available to the widest amount of, of consumers and vehicles possible. And that's what we're advocating for. If I can scratch at one other um, pain point in that process, uh, do consumers care where the EV is made or by whom? Do they care if it's a US made or North America made? Do they care if it's union made? Well, you know, we haven't explored specifically if it's union made or not. Um, we actually just finished some research where we asked consumers kind of from across the spectrum, um, EV owners, uh, people that are interested in EVs all the way down to people who don't really like them. What kind of company would you want to buy an EV from? Is this something where you would turn to the traditional manufacturers or you turn more to an EV specialist? And uh, we were pretty surprised that basically about two to one, the preference is for traditional manufacturers to make electric vehicles. Um, you know, there will oftentimes uh, work with people and they'll say, you know, that, that group of people that they kind of look like early adopters, but why haven't they bought a Tesla? I said, well, they actually really don't want to buy a Tesla. That's one of the, <laughs> the factors. Um, so there's, to us, it gives us a lot of hope for the traditional manufacturers because essentially when they're able to bring compelling product, the consumers are essentially telling us that is, when it comes to electrification, that's actually closer to my ideal than trying to turn to some startup that, I mean, even we asked about Tesla. We said, well, you know, Tesla's been around for a while now. Do you consider them to be established? And overwhelmingly, the answer was no, they are not. They're still new. So. No service centers. It's not, it's easy, not easy to just take it, get it, get your car repaired and stuff right. like that. Yeah. Right. Well, and, and many consumers, they have positive feelings about the vehicles that they have and that they own. I mean, you know, they are such emotional things in our lives that we shouldn't forget that for most of them, those, those positive feelings, I mean, they would like that to carry over to a, a next vehicle, even if the powertrain is different. They're not necessarily looking to abandon the brands that they have, you know, owned over the years. So you, uh, you came on my podcast uh, last month, and one of the things you had recently uncovered was that there was some uh, waning interest in EVs from politically conservative consumers. Uh, 
my my feeling is like maybe just Joe Biden was too attached, becoming too attached to EVs, and it was becoming divisive. Have you seen any more evolution on that, or is, do you have any other new uh, new observations for us? It you know we're we're really seeing that it is continuing. Um, that there, I mean, one of the things that I, I mentioned on the podcast was that you know when when EVs are talked about as something that is helping modernize the United States or kind of keep us on the on the cutting edge they tend to have really widespread appeal when it's seen as when they're seen as part of a, a specific political party's agenda um, or for instance we have seen when the uh There are enough challenges to electrification that we don't need to make it harder. And that essentially, you know, painting them in a political light to me is just, you're, you're going to just start turning off parts of, of potential buyers if, and it's just if, not helpful. If vehicles start becoming political statements, I think we're all in trouble. It should be about the product and about the customer experience, period. If there's one thing we can all come together on, it should be the joy of driving, yeah, we right? Cars, then we all need right. to transport ourselves, right? right? We need to get around. Well, and, and you know, part of it too, when we ask consumers who've either test driven an EV or they've had an experience in one, they come away with really positive feelings. And so in a lot of ways, it doesn't need to be political. You know, there is a universal appeal to the, the feeling of driving one of these vehicles. So, you know, let's try to keep it more focused on that. Are there any other, you know, big deterrents to EVs for mass market consumers now that, that we haven't addressed already? I mean, one of the, the, the uh, deterrents that we do find is that there are certain segments in the marketplace where the technology is going to have to progress quite a bit to meet customers' expectations. Uh, I mean, I'll, I'll point out we've got a number of EV pickup trucks coming to market. Um, we've looked into that pretty extensively, and you know we've got a good read on who are likely to be buyers of those. Uh, and it's it's not people who, for instance, are towing heavy loads or doing things you know sort of really heavy usage. Um, even though those vehicles are being painted in the light of having massive capability, we do see that we have to be careful because you know for somebody who really uses it and kind of takes to the limit of the technology, they can be pretty disappointed. Yeah, a lot of them, the early ones, feel like, uh, more like exotic sports cars than, than work trucks. I mean, I guess we'll, we'll see what, what they come around, you know, as we get further into the, the fleet version of the F-150 Lightning and we get to the Silverado EV instead of just the, the Hummer EV. Yeah. Mike, what are, what are you seeing in um, terms of what, any other concerns about people being the consumer end, if not the dealers? The dealers are all in, but what are... What's keeping them from, from I, selling more? You know, I don't know that concerns. We discussed a lot of that already. I just think it's a very exciting time to be in this industry. And, and what an opportunity we have to maybe do things a little differently, uh, but both with the vehicles we drive and the customer experience. Uh, dealers are really excited about the product. Can't wait for it to get here. And we're having challenges with that that the manufacturers don't, don't necessarily have control over. But we'll get there, and we're excited about it. Any uh, final thoughts about uh, what should people take away as they <laughs> go back to their businesses, go back to their lives, and try to navigate their way through this transition? I mean, I, I will say in the work that we've done, we've found that both when we've talked to dealers, which we do quite a bit of, there is really a lot of excitement about, you know, this is a, these are not, you know, mildly different product from what people have normally been. They're really different and it's actually, you know, it's getting people excited. It is an opportunity and it's, it's really neat to see, you know, again, when we have those, those uh, interactions with consumers who are driving the vehicles, experiencing them, it's really opening up their minds to, you know, a new way in which they envision the vehicle uh, and new ways in which it can integrate into their lives. And it, it also, quite frankly, um, you know, in many cases, with charging or with accessories, it's, it's sort of bringing a new mindset to the vehicle. So it's a, it's a big deal, but it's an exciting opportunity as well. All right. Mike Devorney from Escalant, Mike Stanton, NADA, thank you very much.
Thanks, Jamie. Thank you, Jamie. Thank you both, and thank you, Jamie, for leading a, a fantastic discussion. So we're taking a pause on our live, live stage programming right now because the general session is starting uh, momentarily. It will be streamed here, so if you'd like to watch the general session from here, you can. Um, and if not, it's in the, the North Hall. Um, and we will see you back here at 4 p.m. today. Thank you very much.